built in microphone good morning everybody i am dr varadarajan i am the director of rainbow hospital chennai i am a consultant dealing with pulmonology and infectious diseases and today's topic is going to be wheezing in children because when we say asthma parents get worried and all that we says is not asthma because it is very difficult to label a child as asthmatic i may be seeing a child right from its time of birth but to label a child as asthmatic i need certain criteria till then we call them as depending upon their clinical history and presentation as episodic wheezers or multi trigger wheezer like that wheezing is a symptom whereas the term asthma is reserved for a chronic inflammatory disease that is associated with reversible airway obstruction wheezing is a noise that is produced in the airway when the airway is contract the caliber of the airway can get narrowed because of constriction of the muscles which are lining the airway or due to swelling of the mucous membrane that is lining the airway see there are lots of children who get wheezing when they have a cold or cough several respiratory infections are there several viruses are involved in the causation of respiratory infection the commonest among them are the rhinovirus the respiratory syncytial virus the adenovirus the metapneumovirus influenza and para influenza viruses these are all the viruses that are involved in the causation of respiratory infection in children sometimes when this respiratory infection is severe enough to produce airway obstruction we see a 3 months old child with a short history of cold and cough suddenly developing respiratory distress and when we take an x ray there is no pneumonia and this child does not respond much to bronchodilators as we see in a child that is suffering from asthma so this kind of a presentation we call it as bronchiolitis scientists by following up these children have found out an important thing that nearly roughly one third of the asthmatics in later life when we see in children give a positive history of a respiratory syncytial virus infection at the age of 3 to 9 months so which child among this is going to develop asthma and which child is not going to develop asthma has to be seen to be evaluated lot of these children can develop again and again wheezing with the onset of every cold so what is just a cold you know like they would used to joke cold is a disease which can be treated when by a doctor in 10 days otherwise it takes it, it is just treated in 2 weeks otherwise it takes 14 days so that is a joke generally passed around but in children who are prone for wheezing a cold does not leave as a cold and it always results in the causation of wheeze and respiratory distress and the parents are worried the respiratory distress may be so severe as to require nebulization but whenever we see a child which develops a wheeze only with a respiratory infection viral infection but in between the episodes of viral infection the child is asymptomatic then we call the child as an episodic wheeze and we don't put these children on inhaled steroids we usually give them a bronchodilator either orally or inhaled 
to be given through a space cell. Younger the child, we have to be more careful in finding out the other causes. There are some children who develop vomiting frequently. And this vomiting may be even sometimes curdy, sometimes it will be projectile. And it may be associated with some aspiration or blockage of the nostrils that results in noisy breathing. And this is what we call as gastroesophageal reflex disease. In this disease, the child is more prone for wheezing because the acid reflex that is taking part in the lower end of the food pipe called the esophagus can result in stimulation of the parasympathetic system and that can result in the stimulation of the vagus which is the parasympathetic system that results in bronchoconstriction. So <clears throat> the reflex can aggravate the wheeze and the wheeze can result in cough which can increase the abdominal pressure and that can again aggravate the gastroesophageal reflex. There is a gentleman who has asked, what can I do to stop wheezing? That is the whole purpose of this talk. I'm sure if you follow me up, you will get your answers because I told you at the beginning of the talk itself, all that wheezes is not asthma. Asthma requires prolonged management, whereas wheezing due to recurrent cold and cough, which we call as episodic wheezing, requires only bronchodilators, which can be given orally or through inhalers. There is another gentleman who has asked, will wheezing go away on its own? This requires a long answer. There are some children where there is a strong family history of wheezing. In a Tuxan study, they have followed up children from the age of a few months to the age of 19 years to find out what percentage of children go in for the asthma. If there is a strong family history of asthma or there is a personal history of atopy, what do you mean by atopy? We produce antibodies whenever there is an infection in our body. There is one kind of antibody called IgE antibody, otherwise called as <coughs> reagenic antibody, which does more damage than the other antibodies. Antibodies like IgG and IgM are coming to our rescue to produce antibodies to protect us from the infection. Whereas this reagenic antibody gets attached to a group of cells called mast cells. They break down and they liberate chemical mediators of allergy which can produce depending upon their site. For example, if it is in the nose, it can produce runny nose. If it is in the eye, redness and irritation of the eye. If it is inside the bronchus, it can produce bronchospasm which can result in wheezing. If it is in the skin, it can produce what we call as eczema or atopic dermatitis. So, if there is a strong family history of asthma or there is a personal history of atopy in the child, like the child gets frequent rhinitis, which we call as allergic rhinitis, or the child can have wheezing, recurrent wheezing with eczema. These are the candidates who are more prone for asthma in later life. Some of these children who develop wheezing very early in life can become all right by about five to six years or even seven years when the lumen of the bronchus reaches the adult size. They do not become very dysnic or they do not develop that much distress as they would develop when they are when they are young. So after the age of six or seven, about one third of them become all right. Some of them become all right to develop wheezing again as 
adolescents are as adults. For some of them, there is absolutely no wheezing after that. Roughly, you can say one third, one third, one third. So, for a child that wheezes in early life, the chances of developing asthma in later life is only about 30 to 40 percent. Mushakim has conveyed his wishes to me. And uh, so, uh, there is another gentleman. I have dust allergy. Uh, is it that it can be cured or continued throughout? It will continue throughout my life. Is there a solution to stop it? It's a good question. This is this takes us to another problem called allergic rhinitis. We have to understand allergy, depending upon where it is. When hair grows here, we call it as crop. When it grows here, we call it as mustache. When it grows here, we call it as beard. And when it grows here, we call it as side locks. So after all, we name it. It is hair. Like that. Allergy, the manifestation of allergy can be in different organs. When it is on the nasal mucosa, you develop allergic rhinitis, which we call as cold, repeatedly occurring cold. It is not cold actually. For example, cold, to call it as a cold or paresa, we must have a viral etiology. On the other hand, if there is sneezing and rhinitis, throughout with associated with irritation in the eye or redness in the eye. Then we call it as allergic rhinitis. Nowadays it is called allergic rhino conjunctivitis. When you don't like a person, what do you do? You avoid him. Similarly, you must very difficult to identify the allergy. Sometimes we may be able to identify it, but generally allergy and avoidance is the preferred mode of therapy. For allergic rhinitis, you have to understand, as well as asthma, we have allergens everywhere. We need not go out to inhale the automobile exhaust fumes or to fumes from a chemical factory. But on the other hand, at home itself, in your bedroom, if you have, if you have carpeted your house, that carpet can gather dust mite. If you have woolen garments or if you have, you know, a rug which is made up of wool, that can gather. Even cotton fibers can gather dust mites. These dust mites cannot be seen by naked eye. You require a microscope to see that. They don't bite you, but they live on your dead skin. These dust mites produce most of the allergy indoors. The other allergen can be the excreta of the cockroaches, which you see in your kitchen. In your bedroom, it is the dust mite. In your kitchen, it is the cockroach. In your bathroom, it can be a mold or a fungus and the pollen. So, of an indoor plant. So, the allergy can be due to any of the allergens. So, allergen avoidance is the best thing. You have to wash your pillow covers and bed sheets at least once a week or once in 10 days in hot water because hot water, boiling water kills the dust mite. And you have to dry them up in warm sunlight, hot sunlight. That kills the dust mites also. You can hot iron and put them. You can fit the pillows with allergen proof covers. You can use vacuum cleaners. You can use HEPA filters. So these are all the ways you can avoid the allergen. On the other hand, to tide over the crisis, you can take a bedtime non-sedating antihistamines. Lot of antihistamines which are not sedating you are available. In real extreme cases where you have perennial allergy, we divide the children and adults who get into Allergic rhinitis as seasonal and perennial. Perennial are those who develop the symptoms any time of the year. And we use inhaled nasal corticosteroids, which can be a momentosome or it can be a fruticosome for 
which are found to be safe up to one and a half to two months of continuous usage. Now we have another question. What are the symptoms of wheezing? That the question itself is wrong. Wheezing is a symptom. Wheezing can come in several diseases. I was explaining about acute bronchitis before I started answering your questions. Then I was talking about gastroesophageal reflex disease where reflex takes place and that can instinctively produce a bronchospasm. The bronchospasm can aggravate the reflex. So it results in a vicious cycle. Similarly, we have had children who suddenly develop wheezing. The boy was playing all right, sir, he's one and a half years. He was sitting and eating groundnuts. Suddenly he became choked and he has developed respiratory distress. This is a history we get sometimes. Vegetable foreign bodies. It can be groundnut, it can be tamarind seed, you know, it can be a pea or what we call as patani. And when they are brought, they are in severe distress, hypoxic, struggling to breathe. And when we put the chest and auscultate, we find only one side of the chest there is wheezing. And then we take an x ray, that lung is inflated. We do a screening, we know that there is a vegetable foreign body because of the hyperinflation on that side. And we do a bronchoscopy and remove the foreign body. So this is the situation. So wheezing is a symptom. Asthma is a disease. It is a clinical syndrome. Wheezing can be due to a disease called cystic fibrosis, which occurs in children who fail to thrive, have malabsorption. Wheezing can be heard in congestive cardiac failure when a child has got a congenital heart disease. Wheezing can be there in tropical eosinophilia due to lot of parasites inside the gut. We had a very interesting child from Salem where the child has been treated for wheezing three times. The child has got admitted to the ICU with acute severe asthma. And, but and in spite of giving inhalation therapy, the child was developing again and again wheezing. So when we took an x-ray, we saw that the airway was deviated to one side and that prompted us to do a CT scan which showed a cyst, a bronchial cyst in the carina which has to be surgically removed following which the child became wheeze free. So wheezing is a symptom, not a disease. But asthma is a clinical syndrome where wheezing is a predominant symptom. What causes children to wheeze? I have now given you a lot of scenarios like cystic fibrosis, foreign body, bronchial cyst, bronchiolitis. Commonest is of course the allergen. The allergen can be a dust mite allergen, cockroach allergen or it can be if the father is smoking inside the house, that smoke can induce wheezing in the children, an irritant and a pollutant. If there is somebody who is using wooden stout, where they burn the wood and that produces smoke in the house, agarbattis, samrani, any of these things can result in the child developing wheezing. Automobile exhaust fumes, ozone, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon monoxide, diesel. You know, we had emission check centers all over the country. But are they all functioning now? Because of the lockdown, we see the air so clear now. They are able to see the Himalayas from Punjab. But if we are careful to check the emission, of the various lorries and automobile vehicles and reduce the carbon emission to a very great extent, we will be avoiding outdoor allergens apart from checking that factories follow proper norms to control their fumes that are coming out of their factories. 
So it may be pollen from a plant. It may be fur of an animal because children are very fond of pets. Cats and dogs, which are furry, like Pomeranian or Lasopso, which have a lot of hair, they can accumulate the dust and fleas and stuff the toys. Gone are the days when we were all kids, we used to play with Marapaji Boma, which can be washed. But now children need teddy bear of different sizes, colors, shapes, which accumulate a lot of dust. Westernization has led to the increased incidence of wheezing in many countries. India is no exception. When West Germany and East Germany were separated by the Great Wall of Berlin, the incidence of wheezing was very high in West Germany because it was an industrially advanced country. Whereas East Germany was an agricultural country and wheezing was less in East Germany. When the Great Wall of Berlin was broken and Germany became one, the incidence of asthma in East Germany started increasing. There is a gentleman who was asked, he is a visa and is he prone for COVID? Um, I think we should not get too much worried about COVID now because there are certain comorbidities. Uh, he has not mentioned his age. I would like to say that diabetes, hypertension, if they are uncontrolled and an age above 70, I am 67 still working. So, it is all the confidence that you have in the control of your disease. Probably, the respiratory affection in an individual who is prone for wheezing or who is having a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what we call as COPD, maybe more when he gets a COVID. But I think that should not be a cause of worry for you. Will GERD cause cough and bees? I don't know whether the gentleman has joined late in the talk. I've talked about GERD for about three to five minutes. But to repeat again, GERD is nothing but regurgitation of the gastric contents. That is from the stomach to the foot pipe, esophagus. The lower end of the esophagus is very rich in vagal nerve endings, which belong to the parasympathetic nervous system. Stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system will result in bronchospasm. Once there is constriction of the bronchus, the child will cough. And when it coughs, the abdominal pressure increases, aggravating the reflex. So the wheezing aggravates the reflex. The reflex aggravates the wheeze. So in an uncontrolled wheeze in a child, we always think of GRD. If there is history of vomiting or the child arching back and crying, not putting on weight, what we do, we treat the GRD along with the wheeze. They get very good relief. How do I know if my child is wheezing? That's a good question. Wheezing need not manifest all the time with audible wheeze. Only when the wheeze is very severe, we have audible wheeze. Otherwise, when the bronchus constricts, you will have a dry cough. Dry cough, paroxysmal cough, cough followed by vomiting, cough in the middle of the night or early morning hours of the day. For example, our airway diameter or lumen is very minimal in the early morning hours. In the evening hours, it is slightly better. That is why many of the asthma exacerbations, if you see what we call as acute severe asthma, takes place in the early morning hours of the day or midnight. So, a day midnight cough or an early morning cough, dry cough, hacking cough, Cough that is occurring in paroxysms. Cough followed by vomiting. You must think of wheezing. It will be a dry explosive cough. 
This kind of a cough you will see. Not a moist cough. And when the wheezing is very severe, you know you will have retractions in the intercostal and subcostal muscles. You can lift up the skirt or the shirt of the child and see whether there is any retractions of the intercostal muscles. Are there any home remedies to prevent wheezing? Yes and no. We'll see the yes first. Giving warm water, I would say, is a very good home remedy. Because warm water not only soothens the throat and reduces the cough, it is also a demolition. It is also a mucolytic. It dissolves the thick secretions. So warm water is good. I, I don't mind people giving some manjapuri in, um, the, in milk, warm milk, or some honey in warm water. But too much dependence on native medicines. Because there are some people who will go, who will come and say, Doctor, I've been coming to you for the last two, three years for wheezing for my child. My child is still getting wheezing. Somebody says, if I go to Hyderabad and give a fish, the child will be all right. They will take the child. I allow them to go because, after all, all religions lead to God. So whatever system of medicine you follow, what we want is the child should be cured. But too much reliance on native medicines doesn't help to cure the illness. Because I invariably see them landing up in the emergency room with acute severe asthma. Allopathy has understood the pathophysiology and the etiopathogenesis of asthma much better than the other systems of medicine. Another gentleman has asked, should I take my child to the emergency room for wheezing? It all depends upon how severely ill your child is. Let us assume that your child is suffering from wheezing for a long time and your doctor has prescribed inhaled medications. Inhaled medications are of two types, as I told you. One is a beta agonist, which helps to dilate the bronchus and gives the relief, which we usually give in episodic wheezers. In multi-trigger wheezers, to prevent the disease, we give inhaled corticosteroids, which are steroids in a very minimal dose, in microgram. You know, microgram is one thousandth of a milligram. So when you give the steroid in such a small dose, it reduces the thickening of the basement membrane and it's supposed to prevent wheezing. In such a child, which is on regular medications, you, you are taking your child to the doctor regularly, he will check how you give the medicine through the spacer and mask and if you are giving it properly and the child is getting relieved, he will slowly reduce the amount of medicine that is required for the child. On the other hand, if he thinks by your symptoms, if it is an older child, what we do is we estimate what is called as PEFR, peak expiratory flow rate. We have a meter. It is very easy. You can buy it for 600 rupees not a big deal. You can measure the expiratory capacity of the child because asthma is a disease which produces bees where the child is not able to expel the inhaled air completely. So this PFR will tell you how good is the child's control of bees. You should record it both in the morning and in the evening because young children can be poor perceivers of wheezing. When an adult gets wheezing, he knows he is uncomfortable. I am an asthmatic. So I know when I am going to get an attack. So I will increase the medicine which I am taking. But children, you can't expect them unless they are very sensitive and intelligent when they are going to get into an acute situation. If you are monitoring the PFR 
recording the PFR in the morning and the evening. And uh, you know what is that personal best? When there is a drop in the PFR, we say 80 to 100 percent of the PFR personal best, they are in the green zone where their asthma is well controlled. If it is 50 to 80, then they are in the yellow zone where they need to go to a lung doctor and alter the medicines, either increase the dose or add one more medicine, orally or inhale. If they are in the red zone where their PFR is below 50%, then we know that they are in for danger at any time. And that is the time you have to take the child to the emergency room. What about food restrictions with regards to children with bees? What are we supposed to avoid? This is another myth. Some doctor will say, don't give lemon, chatakudi, citrus fruits. Another doctor will say, don't give egg, fish. The Society for Asthma and or American Academy and CAMP studies have revealed that 88% of asthmatic children the wheezing is because of inhaled allergens. What are inhaled allergens? Allergens that go through the air to the lung. They are called inhaled allergens. But only 12% of the children may have some allergy to an ingested food. For the sake of these 12%, why should we punish 88% of the children? Don't eat chocolate. Don't eat. Will they eat chocolate after becoming a diabetic like me? No. Children are fond of sweets and chocolates. So there is no point in restricting the sweets and chocolate because the child is getting easy. I, in fact, tell the parents to give anything. But there is what is called as if the child happens to be in that 12% where the wheezing is because of the ingested allergen. I used to tell the parents. Notice what really produces the bees. If on three or four occasions you have noted one particular food is related to the wheezing episode, then you can avoid that. It is well within your purview. Unlike eczema, where 40% of the eczema is due to food allergy, on the other hand, asthma. 88% is due to aero allergens. So unnecessary food restrictions in these children will make life very difficult for these children. Is there any precautions that can be followed to avoid wheezing from occurring? Shashikumar. See, I always tell a story. There was a king. He told the minister, whenever I walk in my kingdom, there are a lot of thorns which keep pricking my soul. So you spread carpet all over my country. But the minister said, Maharaja, don't do that. Wear shoes. That is enough. So it is very difficult to live in a country that is dust-free, smoke-free, with so much of industrialization, with so many people using automobiles. But to a very great extent, you can avoid exposure to the allergens and pollutants. Home allergens, I've already told, dust might. Avoid indoor plants, avoid furry pets, avoid cockroaches, avoid molds in the bathroom. Keep the place clean. In olden days, they used to wash the house twice. At least you can dust the house using a vacuum cleaner. Avoid smoke in any form. Maybe cigarette smoke, agarbatti or other sambrani, whatever it is. Automobile exhaust fumes. You can wear a mask when you take the child out to a crowded city or a mall. No. Thanks to the close down of malls and theatres, we see less number of children with wheezing in the last two months. 
So, avoidance of allergen is very important. Like the king wearing shoes, your inhalers and other medicines come to your health to protect yourself because 100% avoidance of allergen is not possible in modern living. Is wheezing dangerous for life? I would definitely say no. See, by God's grace, modern medicine has improved to that extent. We have fantastic medicines to treat acute severe asthma, which is an acute exacerbation of wheezing. If you can detect wheezing and bring the child at an early stage, they don't even require ICU admission. Home management will be giving the inhaled medicine like salbutamol or levosalbutamol through the metered dose inhaler. One puff every two minutes for 10 minutes, about five puffs. That is equal to a nebulization. You may not be having a nebulizer at home. Don't worry. In COVID times, even nebulization is not frequently done because of the fear of dissemination of COVID virus. So, using this will be used. When you bring them to the hospital, they will nebulize with all precautions with doctors wearing a PPE during the COVID times. And if they require ICU admission, we have so many medicines which can be given intravenously as well as through the nebulizer. And there are certain injections called magnesium sulfate. In fact, these days, we don't even see so many children ventilated as we used to see three, four decades ago. How can I clear my lungs of phlegm? <laughs> this is a very nice question. If you look at it, if you have phlegm, you can do steam inhalation. Drink a lot of warm water. Warm water is a mucolytic. Inhale the steam will go and function as a mucolytic in clearing your air passages. If you are one suffering from a disease called bronchiectasis, where the airways are dilated in the sense they become larger in parts so that the phlegm that has accumulated cannot be easily expectorated. Then, you know, cupped hand percussion or chest physiotherapy is useful in clearing the phlegm. What are the myths concerned with wheezing? I find this happening routinely in practice. For example, the child would have gone to the grandparents' house and the daughter-in-law will be blaming the mother-in-law for giving a plantain. The poor grandmother, in all her sympathy to the child, would have given a plantain. The same day, the child would have traveled in a two-wheeler without a mask on a Margai Masa night or December night, where the air is very chill. It must have been the cold air which has resulted in the wheezing. But the daughter-in-law will be blaming the plant when given by the mother-in-law. So, lots of myths are there with respect to wheezing. A lot of people think, you know, particular food substances give rise to wheezing. They say, you know, if I eat plant and I get wheezing, if I eat uh, uh, la banana or apple, I get wheezing. You know, all these things are myths. Similarly, wheezing, wheezing can come due to exercise and also due to worries. That we see usually psychological stress giving rise to wheezing we see in older individuals, not in children. Children are worry free. A group of asthmatics developed when they went on a picnic to a particular park because that was a flowering season and the pollen was responsible for their wheezing. But some of them developed such a severe wheezing, they required nebulization and a few of them required admission because that was the pollen season in that, for that plant. But subsequently, 
during the non pollen season also when they were taken 10% of them developed wheezing in the same park was the very thought that this is the place where i have developed severe wheezing made them get into another bout of wheezing so this shows the psychological factors involved in wheezing there is an entity called exercise induced bronchospasm nowadays we don't call it as exercise induced asthma we call it as exercise induced bronchospasm where getting up early in the morning on a winter day putting on your shoes and going for running can result inhalation of the cold air can result even exercising for 15 to 20 minutes but if you do warm ups and you avoid cold mornings to exercise or take leukotriene receptor antagonists which are there 20 minutes before the exercise or you take a beta agonist inhaler like salvotamol or levosalvotamol 20 to 30 minutes before the exercise you can avoid exercise induced bronchospasm you should avoid all allergens of asthma or stimulants of asthma but not exercise an asthmatic child should be allowed to do regular exercises then only the vital capacity will improve and the child will be fine does the medication given for asthma have side effects like liver injury on long term liver injury is not a definite side effect of uh, anti asthmatic drugs you can be assured but there are some concerns about the long term use of high dose inhaled corticosteroids for example we have so many corticosteroids in inhaled form like butisonide fluticasone sizonide we start with a very low dose of 200 microgram per day and go up to 40, 400 is what we call as a moderate dose in l corticosteroid when you go up to 800 for a prolonged period of time there are some concerns they can produce some growth retardation there were when boys and girls were compared girls had probably more growth retardation than boys to an extent of 1.7 cm up to the total height that they have reached and some concerns about osteoporosis on long term use but if you take calcium and vitamin d and reduce the dose of inhaled steroids with improvement do regular checkups as the child's asthma gets well controlled the dose can be reduced further so you need not worry about this it is on the other hand if you are not going to give inhaled corticosteroids for a child that is having a regular follow up and you are cheating the doctor by not giving the inhaled corticosteroids then the child will require oral corticosteroids for acute exacerbations and these oral corticosteroids have got lot of side effects like producing ulcers diabetic tendency reducing the immunity cataract name it you have it so oral corticosteroids should not be given for a prolonged period of time even when we use it for acute exacerbation of asthma we give it for a period of at the maximum 5 to 7 days and not more does wheezing need antibiotics no there is no no actually many a times in children the wheezing is due to viral infections and viral infections do not require antibiotics there are some studies in some children macrolide antibiotics like azithromycin and they are given have an anti inflammatory action but these we reserve for children with cystic fibrosis and conditions like that we don't routinely give antibiotics for any asthmatic child or for any child with wheezing how many puffs of ventolin is safe see ventolin is nothing but salvotamol i told you 
in an emergency you can go up to five puffs every two minutes one puff total of five after 20 minutes you can repeat another five puffs if the child is not getting relief from this you have to take the child to the emergency room of a hospital thank you reshma for your appreciation thank you all for asking very good questions do i have some more time or it's over yeah so my request to all the parents who are who have assembled on this platform to consider that all that Jesus is not asthma. Younger the child, you have to look for a different diagnosis. If there is a family history of asthma or a personal history of ATOP in the child in the form of allergic rhinitis or eczema, we have to use inhaled drugs in the form of inhaled corticosteroids. You have to familiarize yourself with the use of the inhalation apparatus and how you can give it continuously. How to monitor the child which is suffering from asthma. When to consult a doctor. In an emergency, what you should do. These are all the things which I have covered. I am sure with this added information and knowledge, you can take care of your children with wheezing in a better way. If that happens, I'll be happy about having given this talk. Thank you.